the, the fact that it was a very good discussion at the exchange you know, panel. Um, you know, uh, since I have this a bit of a background in the capital markets, you know, regardless of the market volatility, it is either up or down. The exchanges always win, as well as the brokers. So that's why perhaps our panelists you know, agree on the fact that the market is incredible, even though there's a bull run. So uh, I can understand that. But um, again, the regulation, uh, well, it always trickles down to the regulation. And uh, I mean, uh, there were uh, people outside, uh, there were people outside and asking me about why we are discussing regulation when it comes to blockchain, which is a technology in a way. It is about regulation in a way. So I think it is a big portion about it. And um, I, I keep uh, wondering what would be the perspectives, you know, out of this uh, panel because we have different uh, panelists from uh, different parts of the world. Uh, so I look forward to that. Perhaps I can just ask the microphone to Elchin, our beautiful moderator. So she's going to take care of the, the, the panel uh, by also introducing some facts about Turkish market. So last 40 minutes, sorry about that again. Uh, I know that you guys are a bit tired, but this is cream of the panel, of the, of the event. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the intro uh, introduction. Uh, we're waiting for the microphones to be set up. Uh, in the meantime, uh, thank you very much for being here. It is really nice to see uh, familiar faces and some of the new faces, and I think Coop Hub is uh, has need a really big appreciation for doing this event and uh, getting us all together in this event. It is a really hard job to create such a great network. And while our uh, microphones are being uh, adjusted, let me introduce myself. I'm Atin Karatay. I am uh, the managing partner of Solak and Partners Law Firm in Istanbul. I'm currently working on blockchain technologies uh, and many type of laws, commercial law and uh, law of obligations. We will have a lot of important guests and when we're done, I will uh, want to ask them to introduce themselves. And by the way, uh, we have heard that all in all the panels regulation has come up and I think lawyers have never been more interesting or famous in their lives before blockchain, so it's really interesting. Uh, Please. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I would first uh, want to kindly ask my guests to introduce themselves and uh, talk about what they're doing and where they're coming from, actually. Thank you. <laughs> so. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's always uh, like this, you know, when we deal with regulation at the end of the day, it's like <laughs> this. I'm coming from France. I'm Frank Gayoder. I work at GID. Uh, GID is an international law firm based in Paris, but we also have 14 offices worldwide. And prior to this, I worked for the French uh, Markets Authority at the French AMF, and I was in charge of innovation in FinTech. Hello everybody, uh, I'm Chida Mayas Uh First of all, I'd like to welcome all our foreign um, participants to this uh, lovely city. It's the best time to enjoy Istanbul. I hope you will have time to enjoy Istanbul. Uh, I am attending uh, this conference uh, on behalf of SRP Legal Law Firm as the managing director of the law firm and the founder. Uh, SRP Legal is, a, is, is an Istanbul-based law firm, uh, mainly working on corporate law areas and two expertise areas. One is competition law and the other one is technology law, which I uh, have my PhD degree in. And I also, I am a lecturer at two universities. One is the State University, uh, Istanbul Technical University, and the other one is Blockchain, um, Blockchain Institute in Bahçeşehir University. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, first and foremost, it's a pleasure being here. I thank you all, even though it's, it's late. So I know that it's going to be a little bit hard for you. Um, my name is Ian Gauci. Here I'm wearing uh, more than one hat. So I am a technology lawyer. I have my own law firm, 
We specialize predominantly in technology. I am as well, um, I would say, for my sis, the chief legal um, expert on the blockchain task force, the National Blockchain Task Force. I had an active part in drafting the laws. I am advising the Financial Services Authority. I advise as well the new setup Digital Innovation Authority, and I'm an advisor as well uh, for the Motor Communications Authority, given that I am a telecoms lawyer as well. I also happen to be a lecturer. I lecture at university, I lecture students, lecture masters at master's degree as well. And final cap, one which is very, very important because I've been hearing a lot of um, social benefit. I am also the co-founder of the Malta Blockchain Association, a non-profit organization which is meant to be like a sort of centrifuge where we collect a lot of information from all industries, where we can assist governments because we can analyze this information, where we can share this information as well, not only locally, but even abroad. So I end up with this. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, then let's uh, start our session with the questions. I actually have really simple, but at the same time hard questions. Um, I actually want to ask all the panelists, what is the legal structure currently in your own jurisdictions? And I know that there is a lot of um, things going on with friends, and I know there is some laws in Malta. So uh, I will give it to the floor to you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, at GID, we have decided to set up uh, a new team dedicated to innovation based in France because something is happening in France. Yes. Um, you're certainly aware of the fact that um, all the public bodies in France have decided to set up dedicated teams for innovation, for blockchain, for uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, for all the ro robotization in the financial industry particularly. And um, it, um, it led the authorities uh, to propose new uh, regulations. Uh, so blockchain uh, in France is not just a buzzword, it is in the law now. I can give you four examples. Uh, the first one is related to crowdfunding. Uh, you can use blockchain to issue what we call um, mini bonds. Um, so you can use blockchain to issue uh, financial instruments. And so you can decrease uh, the infrastructure costs um, behind, uh, behind uh, your insurance, so it's really important for crowdfunders. Uh, the second example uh, deals with uh, the recognition of the blockchain as a register uh, for the transfer of ownership of unlisted securities and also uh, units uh, of investment funds. So this is also something new that um, companies, startup and also incumbent players can use uh, to um, uh, in their activities. Uh, we also have a good news today because last week in France we have inserted uh, a new regulation for ICOs. So I think that we rank first uh, within the EU, so we're very proud of this, but it's more important for, of course, companies because uh, today um, we are sure that um, it, should be, it should come into, uh, into force uh, early next year. Um, so it, would, it will be possible for uh, ICO issuers in January uh, to grant an authorization at the AMF. It's an optional regime, so it's not uh, uh, totally binding, but if you want, you can grant an authorization and organize your ICO with rules, um, particularly dealing with information and also uh, with uh, AML, it's of utmost importance. Um, but this is something that could help uh, to sort the, um, the wheat from the chaff. Uh, it's really important, of course, for entrepreneurs. And uh, last but not least, we've been working strongly uh, at GID with the public bodies uh, to propose new rules for the secondary market in the crypto sphere. So all the activities existing in uh, investment banking uh, can also exist in the crypto environment. So we've been working to propose rules for trading, for, um, for market making, for asset management, for custodians, um, existing in the crypto environment. So it will be in the French law uh, early next year, so I think it's really something useful for entrepreneurs and also for incumbent players because we see more and more uh, banking groups, for instance, uh, developing crypto activities uh, in France but also abroad, and uh, I think it's a good signal uh, to, to, to encourage innovation from France or from somewhere else. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Igazar, do you have any uh, thoughts?
talks about the Turkish legal system. We don't have any specific laws, but still. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elçin. Uh, yes, in a nutshell, uh, we can, I can say that easily we don't have a blockchain legislation yet. But what we have, uh, the, the, the current situation of the government has very recently changed. If we look a bit uh, backward, in 2013 and 14, um, the banking authority in Turkey and also the uh, Capital Market Markets Board, as well as the um, um, the, uh, the Financial Crimes Investigation Board uh, already um, already said that uh, oh, these uh, money transfers uh, over blockchain or using Bitcoin uh, can be is named as suspicious transactions. And now recently, uh, in when we come to 2018. The government uh, changed their um, attitude from uh, negative to lukewarm and warm, uh, saying that Turkey will uh, working on uh, its own cryptocurrency, and uh, there are certain types of um, projects that we already know that the government is still working on, and the government is now. Um, um, let's say, supporting the projects uh, with the uh, NGO side uh, and the R&D side. Um, so, um, and also uh, when it comes to um, the certain types of uh, uh, the usage of blockchain, uh, let's say uh, smart contracts, yes, there is no blockchain regulation for smart contracts. But there are certain types of um, legislations for smart contracts that we can apply to the smart contracts on blockchain, uh, like consumer protection law, etc. And also, when it comes to cryptocurrency, yet it is not being regulated by the banking authority, but uh, electronic money and uh, financial transfers um, has been regulated by the banking authority and so uh, I'm sure sooner or later uh, it will be in their agenda. Uh, what else? Um, uh, when, when we say regulation there are three types of regulation. Uh, one is the economic regulation, the other one is legal regulation, and the third one is technical regulation. So I think uh, we should start uh, working on the technical regulations uh, in order to regulate blockchain in Turkey. Thank you very much, Mr. Gauci. Everyone is wondering about Malta, so uh, can you explain that in like five, okay. ten minutes? <laughs> Don't be surprised, you are not starting with most. I would to laud, first and foremost, um, Istanbul and Turkey. Uh, irrespective of the laws, um, it has been a pleasure. I'm meeting a lot of intelligent, interesting people. It seems that there is the right attitude for innovation to prosper. And I put an emphasis on innovation, not blockchain. Because at the end of the day, innovation is the most important thing. Blockchain is a subset. It could be a driver for innovation. I want to load as well my colleague, France. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be there in October. France is one of the leading countries in Europe, but not the first. Malta is the first. We have a framework which is ready. We have a framework, and I'm going to try to briefly explain what the framework is, which touches as well on ICOs. It was meant to be operative by October, but we did not make it. We were rushing, so we asked um, policymakers to give us an extension because we want all the framework to be out. We want everything to be transparent so that whoever comes in and wants to invest knows exactly the rules of the game. Otherwise, we'll be cheating on people. So we have the laws are out. We're consulting on rules, and uh, these will be up and running by first week of November. And that is the official date. So we are the first country in Europe um, to have a fully-fledged ICO regulation. But it's not only ICO. We as a country have been working on this front for the past three to four years. 
And our ambit was to empower the individual. Here we're speaking about a foundation in technology, which is blockchain. Let's park a little bit cryptocurrencies. So blockchain, DLT, is a foundational technology. Foundational technology can have three different ambits. It can disrupt existing business, it can regenerate, okay? And it can create. So to a, to a certain extent, it can innovate. We want innovation, respective of the technology. So there, we believe as well that innovation comes by empowering, by educating, by making sure that the individual uses the technology, innovate. So we have uptake. So there we created something which is sort of innovative. We created a digital innovation authority, which is an, an authority which will be tasked, and the laws will be up and running in November as well, will be tasked with innovation. So as my colleague said, it's IoT. It could be in the future as well um, artificial intelligence. Um, it is DLT right now, predominantly. It is smart contracts, an authority which will certify on a voluntary basis technology arrangements, including DLT, and we're going to issue certification criteria, which mandates as well, for the time being, two initial roles, but very, very important. One of a systems administrator, because irrespective of the technology, we believe that initially there needs to be a human who is responsible, otherwise we're going to have chaos. Might be, we might come at a time where technology is so safe, where we know bias, where we know the exact parameters of operation, where technology can self-sustain itself but we're not there as yet. So there needs to be a human who is accountable, who is responsible, in the eyes of the authority and within the eyes of the users as well. And we created another function, and this is quite novel, of a systems auditor. If you look around, even though it is very, very logical, you have people in different facets of society who are licensed. I am a lawyer, I cannot operate without a warrant. If you have a bus driver, he cannot operate without a license, and a specific license at that, depending on the particular vehicle that he's driving. If you're a notary, if you're an architect, and it goes on, okay? Believe it or not, when it comes to technology, which is so pervasive, and here we're speaking about algorithmic governance, code, where a coder can be a 10-year-old, and with a simple computer at home and four lines of code, he can create disruption. However, coders, software people, are not licensed. There is no warrant. Is this, is this the word we want to embrace in the future? So we're saying, listen, let's start creating the foundational block so that we create as well criteria for warranting these people. Why? Because to a certain extent, the technological remit of DLT of innovation depends upon them, even artificial intelligence, because these people code. And here we're speaking about code. So code is very, very important. We're trying to make it safe. We're trying to make it apt for use. The second piece of legislation there touches on smart contracts, where we are creating private law provisions on the use of DLT, mimicking, for example, where you have equivalence of a ledger, amending as well the electronic money institution directive, um, amending as well um, the e-signature directive, so that we make sure that evidence which is trust-based is as well allowed in court because of trust certificates in a DLT environment, making sure as well that we capture legal personality in the future, because with legal personality we might attach liability, and liability is very important, and where possible, mitigate as well legal liability, okay, within a sentence and bit for developers, because otherwise the developers won't create. So you need to give them the right impetus. Yes, we want to warn them, but we have to give them the right impetus. So there, we started with technology, because here technology is the enabler. We started with code, because we're speaking about code, <coughs> algorithmics. Based on that, then, our third facet was cryptocurrencies. It was not the first third facet. There we were seeing that it was predominantly an area where there was a lot of uncertainty. There, it's an area where it's a cowboys and Indians arena, okay? And there was a lot of fraud, let's face it. A lot of ICOs are fraud. Okay? No, no double jargon on that. They are fraud. So we analyze the situation, we analyze the scenario. We still saw potential in ICOs, and I explain why. If we're saying that the individual is self-sovereign, okay, to a certain extent, you need to empower the individual as well to decentralize certain activities. So if you don't empower the individual to be able to invest privately, and ICO is, an, is a fantastic vehicle for the individual, to exercise his right to invest privately, then 
right now we have 80-85% of all the funding is done by banks, by family offices. So you will never decentralize a bank, you will never distribute the function of a bank unless you start from there. So we said, listen, we believe that ICO, given the right dimension, could be safe. Let's, based on the same parameters before, empower the individual. There we created a basic test, which is very, very similar to what they have as well in Switzerland. We have three different distinctions of tokens. I will not waste my time on the distinctions, but what is a security, what is a financial instrument is out, because that is method-based. And we created a financial instrument test to determine that. It's official by the authority. What is a utility, pure virtual token? So something which is predominantly meant to be used within a specific user's group and on the originating DLT, we don't regulate. What is not that, so it is a medium of exchange, a store of value, we regulate. So that is called a BFA. And there we are regulating, and here we are regulating because of consumer confidence. So we are regulating, similarly to the regulation we have in the financial services industry, but more light touch. What is required in a white paper, so there you have the elements of the prospectus, um, regulation, the elements of the transparency directive, okay? What kind of expertise do you, do you need to have? The expert group, what kind of warranties, what, ty what kind of guarantees? But we put something else. We put a requirement, actually two requirements. We put a requirement that you need to have a VFA agent that monitors, that makes sure that everything is okay, that is liable within the eyes of the authority and the individual, okay? So that is a sort of gatekeeper. They check that the, that the token, the particular token, is a VFA token. They make sure that the white paper is in line with the parameters at law and it respects as well the fundamental principles of consumer legislation because you cannot move away from those. Then we make sure as well, and here we tie this activity with the um, ambit of the new authority as well, the Digital Innovation Authority. If you're promising something in a white paper and that white paper is reflected in a technology arrangement, smart contract, we want to make sure that the objectives are met as well in the technology arrangements. So we impose a condition where that technology arrangement needs to be certified by a system auditor, certified in turn by the authority. And the criteria for certification would come from this new authority. So there you check, for example, that if you have no unilateral right to amend because you need to protect the investor, the technology, the system administrator, the system auditor, we need to check that the code does not allow at an, IP, at an IP protocol level that there is unilateral amendment, that there is no hidden smart contract behind that contract. So we make sure that when you amend, you need to invoke certain rights of the individual, where the individual there, you have to amend the white paper, and the individual have a, has a right to rescind. So it's basic principles of consumer legislation. Now if you tell, this is the legislation, if you tell me is it perfect, Nobody has a crystal ball. But at least us, like France, we did the first, the first step. We felt you don't regulate for the fun of it or to say that, listen, guys, we are the first. You regulate because there is a need. So we felt that there is a need. And if we really want, we have heard a lot of stuff about token economy where you're tokenizing everything. You might as well tokenize a lawyer in the future. But you need to have a safe environment. That starts from the technology. That starts as well then, eaves on, on the institutional framework. So at least we're starting from somewhere. Thank you very much uh, for this brief introduction. And uh, <laughs> let me say that November, you said? November. We can We can do it on, I think, October. <laughs> we can be the first ones. <laughs> Uh, just kidding. Uh, what I understand from all of these talks, and I want to note that even if Turkey does not have a specific law, and even if Malta and France will have specific law, there are certain directives and laws that the companies has to comply with, whether there is or there is not a specific law. So I think what is missing for most of the cases, uh, the ICOs or blockchain projects actually do not see that they are there are some applicable laws other than uh, fi the laws on financial institutions. That it's, mm. it's a really important point to um, look at. And what I understand again from all these talks that it is really hard to have a balanced environment between investor protection and you know thriving, creating, enhancing the innovation. There is a really hard balance on that. And 
it is actually really hard. And we should look at the philosophical questions too. Do we actually allow the investors, maybe the consumers, the basic investors to invest in really high risk products such as ICOs and very technical products? And there is a lot of questions there to be answered. And apart from uh, all the talks, I really want to ask now my panelists if they are the regulator themselves, which in some cases they are, they are helping with, what would they do? What do they think five years from, ten years from now on, uh, the regulation will look like? I know it's a hard question, but uh, if you may start. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for this interesting question. Uh, no, because uh, um, I live within the EU and beyond <laughs> Our jokes uh, on uh, who is uh, ranking first uh, within the EU, I think that the most important issue now is really to work at the European level uh, with the European Commission, but also with our European partners, I mean uh, our non-EU partners. It's also important to work with Tokyo, for instance, um, uh, to see um, to what extent we could um, pull on the existing rules, because uh, as you know, we are just getting out uh, a long wave of regulation at the EU level, after a lot of frauds also. Um, but uh, we know, and we work on a daily basis with our European partners, that uh, the European bodies at the moment want to leverage on these rules. And I think it's not the good way. Because we all know that this is not just you know, a new language, just a new ledger, one more ledger. No, it's a new paradigm. And in front of this new paradigm, we, we have to open the Pandora box um, and to see, okay, we have definitions in, in this box that cannot apply to this new paradigm. So we have to work on definitions. We have to, know, to work on the new kind of intermediaries because sometimes we think that because of the blockchain or thanks to the blockchain, there's no intermediary. No, it's totally wrong. There are new kind of intermediaries. It's very interesting to see uh, what are the risks the new kind of risk, uh, the new types, sorry, of risk behind these new intermediaries, and to address these new kind of issues uh, in, 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 uh, in the regulation. So this is the first thing to do. And after this, we also have to create awareness uh, with all the people working in the public bodies and also sometimes in the private sector to explain exactly when the blockchain is really useful. This afternoon I heard that sometimes someone would say, no, it's not useful in this particular case. And it's often the case, because we, we all want to blockchainize something, you know? Even my mother wants to blockchainize uh, his, his, his cake, her cake. So I don't understand why, but it's like this. Because it's a buzzword, it's a trend, so from a regulatory perspective, we have to, to, create, to create awareness, to work together, and to work on definition concepts, and to see to what extent we can use existing rules and build together um, a best-in-breed solution stemming from existing rules and new rules applying to cyber security risk, new kind of intermediaries and so on. Thank you very much. Ms. Eigesart, do you have any? <laughs> yeah, it's a very good question that we should all discuss on. Uh, I mean, uh, personally, uh, I have the experience to consult the regulatory authorities in terms of uh, how to do the regulation and legislations. And uh, now uh, we have a proposal to the, uh, one of the authorities for, for, for the crowdfunding legislation uh, in Turkey. Uh, yet it's still a proposal, uh, not drafted. So. Uh, we, we, we need to discuss it more, that, that's, that's the first thing. But whatever we discuss in our own, own um, um, territories, let's say, uh, or countries or in EU level, what, whatever it is, since we are talking about a global technology, we, we should uh, find out a way uh, uh, in a, a global solution. And this global solution, whatever it is, uh, maybe some of the currencies will not be stay uh, in five years' time, but the blockchain technology will stay. That's what I personally believe. So we have to discuss the, um, the security 
and the standards of technology first, then uh, how to regulate it, it and the regulation, uh, the, the, the global harmonization of regu reg regulation is a must. Um, and um, for, 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 for the investors' point of view, I mean, investors are uh, like startups or these small investors like us, like um, consumers. Uh, what, what we are looking for as the uh, investors, we need um, transparency, uh, we need uh, predictability. So uh, the government's uh, attitudes should be transparent and pe uh, predictable uh, because when you do an investment, it's, it's ne never a short term. It's always a mid-term or a long term. That's why it's called investment. So uh, predictability and transparency uh, will bring sustainability. Uh, so that uh, people uh, can trust in blockchain uh, technology and industry. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gauci, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, keep it brief, I promise. <laughs> okay, thank well, you. I, I, I agree with both the previous interventions. This is something of a global scale. You can, even if you have the perfect legislation, which nobody has, you need to collaborate. Why? Because the effect is global. It is distributed. It is totally decentralized to a certain extent. So there I agree. I agree as well with the previous comment. What the previous comment is on legal transplantation. You cannot use an existing legislation for something which intrinsically, it's not that it is different, but the effects, because whenever you do a regulation, you need to anticipate the effects you need to know exactly the entry point, you need to know the cost for the entry point, and you need to anticipate the exit point. And I will touch on this as well very soon. So there, this is something completely different. We have different facets, we have different outcomes, so we need to start thinking outside of Pandora's box. If we start using existing tools, I think we're meant to fall there. It's not that we don't use them to transit, but we need to transit. So in using them, we already know that they are just a stepping stone. That is very important. Now, blockchain. We were mentioning blockchain is an old technology. Blockchain is not a new technology. Blockchain is old. Blockchain is old as much as smart contracts are old. 1990, there was EDI before, 1960s. Okay? To a certain extent, if you see cryptography, it is old as well. Even the ciphers are old. Okay? Electronic signatures, PKI, it is old as well. What is the difference? that with the emancipation of the individual, with the new technology, even cryptocurrencies, you had, you had uh, gold cash before Bitcoin. Now we have an empowering machine which captures all these elements together. And you have the user which is more emancipated. You have technology which is more at reach. That is why it is pervasive. And that is the starting point. So when we try to make, when somebody tries to make technology safe, and then technology apt for use, they are different. Safe is one thing, apt is commensurate with certain legal parameters which are at the order of the day applicable. That is different, okay? There the exit point is that when you make sure that technology is safe, for example in regulation we have the concept of RegTech, where regulation will not replace, because it will never replace, it will assist the regulators in innovative ways how to regulate where aesthetic environment, okay, because right now we have aesthetic environment, will move to a dynamic platform on dynamic stuff. Because when you speak about technology, it's dynamic. So that is the output point. The output point is, as much as it is good for rec tech, then it can be good as well for consumer legislation. Because if you have a technology which is safe, where you can ascertain what is on the blockchain and you're transacting, why do you need consumer legislation? Why do you need... Uh, cooling of periods of 14 days. So why do we have the caveat mercatori? Why don't we bring back the caveat emptor? Because to a certain extent, the technology will not discriminate. But we make sure that before that particular moment in time, the technology is safe. So the user knows when they are using it that it will not discriminate. So the exit point is, to cut the long story short, 
that by empowering the technology, we are empowering ourselves because in the future, technology could reduce half of our existing legislation. I think Mr. Agude has yeah, a point. <laughs> just add something because um, uh, just an example to answer your question okay. concerning investor protection. Uh, we've been working with a lot of clients worldwide. Uh, we expect something, we expect a new regulation, and som sometimes there, there's nothing. So it's really interesting to see that um, we help them to structure, uh, for instance, KYC processes, AML tools, educational tools, to enhance uh, the way they communicate with their customers. And it's really interesting to see that these companies themselves uh, want to differentiate from all the, you know, the the scams, the frauds, the mavericks existing on this market. So it's interesting to see that the first phase in terms of regulation, it's a phase of self-regulation. Mm -hmm. And for this, they need to be accompanied, of course. But uh, this is the first phase. And after this, uh, on the base, uh, if we observe what, what's happening in the market, uh, I think that regulators could set, set up something relevant, something balanced between uh, what existed in the previous times and what uh, can, be done, can, be do now, can be done now. Sorry. Thank you very much. Do you have any more comments on this issue? Okay, then let me have a little summary of uh, my thoughts. I understand, as I have said before, it is really hard to regulate a new technology uh, and uh, find a balance, but I find it really similar to maybe intellectual property law, because intellectual property rights do not fit in any other uh, asset type before and there is a new law and there is now a practice and I think what blockchain and ICOs will see is a similar project in my opinion and what I saw um, during my work uh, in blockchain technology and blockchain law that education is needed I know it is not an important regulatory point maybe but both on financial literacy, uh, financial institutions, legal structures and technology, I think education will be a really important tool for us to regulate and protect the investors uh, in a really easy manner. And uh, with these last words, I would like to ask the audience if they have any questions, uh, preferably short. Uh, yes, please. I think the microphone is coming. <laughs> Uh, this is Endar from Monetize Crypto Solutions. Uh, I would like to ask a maybe more technical question. Um, you know, immutability is a feature of blockchain. You can't delete data from your uh, blockchain system by design. So, is it a problem with on GPDR compliance, or so how can we solve this problem uh, as an ICO owner? Do you? Uh, have any recommendation? What's your suggestion? This is a hard question, but if you may. <laughs> uh, let, let me start with immutability. <laughs> immutability is not an absolute term. It is not immutable, it is incorruptible, even at a code level, because you have the 51% rule, and to a certain extent, that 51% rule. And when you fork, that in itself is tantamount to not being immutable. So we say incorruptible. But I agree with your point. To a certain extent right now, we have, and I believe even my colleague was mentioning before, we have certain laws, for example, the GDPR, when it was done, it did not have the illuminating model blockchain brings about, okay? As a matter of fact, it targets specific operation when you have silos of data. The blockchain is completely different. Nonetheless, technology, okay, and I've met even certain people here who are coming up with very innovative aspects of it, I think is bridging that gap, but the law is still not in line. So there, my suggestion has always been, similar to what happens in the IPR world, okay, where you have safe use provisions, where there are certain exemptions, I think within the ambit of the GDPR being reasonable and applying what the law states, for example, contrary to consumer legislation, in consumer legislation, you cannot put waivers, it's very clear, even if you put it in bold, underline it, if it's a waiver, it is not applicable. Null ab initio. In G the GDPR, in data protection, that is not the case. So I think we need to be smart, we need to be bold. It's a pity that Euro the European Union, even the data protection supervisor, is going to tap into this in years to come. 
when we're seeing so much potential, we're seeing countries like Malta and France, or two European countries, rolling out networks. The European Commission asking us, because we need to consult with them, um, what we're doing. And then, something which is so critical is not being tackled. However, I would say that for the time being, reasonableness, reasonableness and technology and education, because I met people telling me, ah, this does not apply here. Then if there's a problem, we'll see what we're going to do. That's a very wrong attitude when you have 20 million fines, maximum fines, 4% on gross revenues, and you're playing around with consumer data. So there you can have as well tort-based claims, irrespective of administrative claims. So I would say that initially, it is going to be a collaborative effort and trying to get all these elements together, hoping that in years to come, because it, it, will, it will take some time, the new regulatory group of the GDPR, the, uh, which replaced the Article 29 Working Party, comes with a coherent position, and if not, other regulators who are bold, okay? For example, France has one of the best data protection authorities um, around. They managed as well to get Google, worse, I believe even worse than Spain, mm -hmm. <laughs> correct? Get Google down to their knees, and rightly so. I think certain authorities, and here it needs to be an authority which has a lot of muscle and a lot of strength, need to come up with these innovative ideas, and at least we start discussing about them. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of questions, a lot of rhetorical answers, but no solutions. I want to yes, yes, please, please. Um, as an uh, expert on data protection and privacy area, uh, what I want to stress is before GDPR, you know, European uh, Committee has 9548 directive, uh, and that directive needs a special um, pr provisions for telecoms uh, industry. So, with, from that need, the telecom industry um, um, launched another type of um, directive called uh, e-privacy directive. So, uh, of course, uh, GDPR doesn't meet the expectations of blockchain technology. So, that's been the case. Uh, I'm sure the e European Commission uh, will start uh, discussing the needs of this new uh, global technology and uh, now they are discussing uh, the renewal of e-privacy directive so uh, hopefully uh, the needs of blockchain technology will be placed in this e-privacy directive uh, either in e-privacy directive or whatever we call in a new directive let's say it, it should be regulated because it doesn't meet the expectations of the GDPR doesn't meet the expectations of this technology and um, the um, uh, yes it, it doesn't meet the expectations do you have any notes? Oh, just one word yeah yes that's exactly why I mentioned the Pandora box it's a perfect example uh, there, there are discussions ongoing at the European Commission at the EU level, and we are part of this, um, to see to what extent we could just uh, adapt uh, GDPR or if we have to create a new piece of legislation. So, of course, we have to work on these definitions to, to make things better. Um, but we don't know exactly because, as you know, the technology is also evolving day after day. That's why we, I think that we have to remain technology neutral uh, as more as possible. Uh, it's important. Uh, we, we, we should not regulate the technology per se. We have to regulate the usage behind the, tech the, the technology. This is how France, for instance, make proposals to the European Commission and we are part of these discussions. Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? I think there is a question there. The microphone is coming. <laughs> okay. And uh, we're ri running out of time, so I hope for an easy, short question. Well, Thank uh, you very much. Unfortunately much. not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe a, a bit provocative question. Um, uh, blockchain technologies uh, are new and um, not relatively new, uh, but difficult to understand and disruptive technologies. And 
it's 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 really difficult to understand even for for the mathematicians, even for for the engineers, software developers. Um, as you as lawyers um, are trying to uh, regulate or work with regulators to put new regulations to regulate these difficult technologies, even to understand for the engineers. How these two disciplines, different disciplines, work together, or are you working? How are you working together with uh, uh, the, the technical people? Um, um, I, I, I don't understand how does it work. I mean, who is to answer? Um, this one, one part, and uh, as, as another note, uh, uh, just for you, um, okay, uh, Ian. Thank you. Um, I completely disagree that uh, what you said with uh, software and uh, developers should be regulated, uh, should be licensed, or you said that developers should be licensed. I don't think they should be licensed, but the work maybe, the work they have done uh, maybe should, should be subject to some licenses. Yes. Well, diversity is the mother of all creation, so at the end of the day, we have divergent opinions. Um, uh, but I still respect your opinion. Now, let me tell you how we work. Our legislation has been done, and it is technology neutral. So it is a technology arrangement. I did not put any emphasis on blockchain. It is a technology arrangement um, by engineers for engineers. So we work with computer scientists with PhD in the, in the area, with lawyers who could bridge the gap between technology and law. Why? Because this is another nice facet about blockchain. It's bringing a nice intersection. And it's not only technology and law, technology, law, and financial services. Untapped before. So that is why we intervened. We are not regulating technology. It is voluntary. We're making it safe for use. As much as in the GDPR, you have privacy by design. Okay? We make it safe by design. Make it sure, however, that the design, contrary to GDPR, where we're saying it's technology neutral, but the safe, the privacy by design is aimed at a particular technology, okay? That's not stifle innovation. So to a certain extent, it is there where we go at code level, where we see the outputs, where we have particular criteria, safety criteria, where we even distinguish between a public, a private, and a hybrid. Because there, the level of administration, in a public, you cannot have an administrator. It's impossible. It's totally decentralized. To a certain extent, it's permissionless. But in a hybrid, depending on the activity in the hybrid, or in a private, okay, you can have an administrator. So we are making that technology the output of the technology safe. And we look as well at the stack. That is something done, however, by our computer scientists. But to a certain extent, I hate to use regulation when it comes to technology. We're regulating hard, however, when it comes to ICOs. That yes, technology not. It is voluntary. We want to make sure that there is a trust element. Why? Because in the future, that same technology will lead us to a trustless environment. But I think we're far away from that. Do you have any notes on the question? Really briefly, uh, I think that's um, exactly why I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> and, uh, and I work in a law firm. Um, because I think that uh, law firms uh, have to open their chakras. Uh, and have to, they have to have the capacity to explain and to understand the economics. And I would say the tokenomics of this industry. It's not so easy. So I think it's important for law firms like JIT um, to include non-lawyers with a background in engineering or, or something else, economics for instance, uh, and to work with lawyers to structure something relevant in balance. And we need both. We need to understand the law, how law is structured, and also we need to understand these tokenomics. For instance, uh, if you want to evaluate the network effect, which is of the most importance uh, in this industry, you need to work on economics. If you need to understand also um, uh, the, the, the added value of an ICO, it's not easy at the beginning to understand the economics behind an ICO because you have to, you know, to forecast new things in a new environment, with new partners, with new paradigms. So you have to work with economics and mathematicians. So my background is, is, is mathematics, finance, economics, and so on. And I work with lawyers because I need lawyers to explain me how it works uh, in the law. So I think it's a good example to answer your question. And if I may add a little um, part, personally, a part of being a lawyer, I have a minor in economics. 
and I also have worked in a software company before and I know coding and I actually studied um, for a bit applied mathematics in Stanford University. So I think where we're coming from, uh, apart from being lawyers, we're reading a lot of technological developments and we're really trying to understand, personally me and I know my colleagues here, to understand the technology behind. So uh, it is really important to work together and I know that the lawyers and regulators have a bad reputation of you know, getting things harder but what we are trying to do, I know my colleagues, to, uh, to create a balanced and equal environment because not every project is uh, safe to invest in. So that is what we try to do and I know it's really hard to do it in a decentralized world with you know, centralized authorities but Still, uh, we're trying to do our best, but I think uh, there is a lot of coalition going on, and uh, don't worry, we're trying to our best to understand the technological pathways. Good to you. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. If you have anything to add, no, I, <laughs> I uh, sorry. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> uh, SRP Legal is a medium-sized law firm in Turkey, in, based in Istanbul. And we are 15, um, in the team we are 15 people and one of them is, has an economic degree. Uh, some others has a master's degree in economy, I, I don't count them, but one is an economist specialized in financial economy and the other one has a degree, but only degree in um, industrial engineering. It is, so, it uh, for, for, for regulation, uh, we, we need to work in a multidisciplinary area. That's the, that's the answer. So it's, it's a very, very um, right question. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for all of the panelists and all of you for staying here and bear with us. Uh, thank you very much to Coop Up again for creating such a great event and getting us all together. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to the panelists. It looks that you guys are not lawyers. It is not